His people called him the gods, they wanted to get rid of him, so she responded to them, Anu responded to them, he is the god of the gods, so he and the rest of the gods agreed to create a person who would meet Gilgamesh with his great power, so they created Enkidu. Enkidu lived in the forest with animals, ate from plants and drank from water, lived the life of monsters and defended them. One day a hunter came to the forest to hunt animals as usual, set his traps, and if he saw Enkidu, he got into his heart a great fear of his size, strength, and thundering voice. He returned to his father, told him what he saw, and also told him that whenever he set a trap, Enkidu came to him and cut him to pieces with his amazing strength. So his father ordered him to go to Gilgamesh, to tell him about the problem, and he would find a solution there. The hunter met Gilgamesh and told him the news of Enkidu, so Gilgamesh ordered the hunter to take with him the holy horse Shamat from the temple of Ishtar, according to what I read that the bitch was holy and worked in the temple. Do not ask, how is that? The story, I remember it as it is. And then he asked him to order her to undress, to be seen by Enkidu, to see her charms, and then to lead them together. The hunter went with moles until they reached the forest, and if they saw Enkidu after days of waiting, and when Enkidu approached them, she did as Gilgamesh recommended, and Enkidu liked her, so he spent seven days and seven nights with her and after those days if he was exposed to animals, she no longer knew him, and she ran away from him, and he lost a lot of his powers, he could not keep up with her by running, and despite losing some of his advantages, he became wise and enlightened. Shamat asked him to come to the city of Uruk with her to lead the brutal life he leads, and to move on to civilian life, she asked him to go to the temple of Ishtar, there he would get acquainted with King Gilgamesh, the powerful king, who was by the power of the bull, the authority over all people. Before that, on the condition that he would go to Gilgamesh and wrestle him to conquer him, they set off together for the city. Meanwhile, Gilgamesh dreamed of stars falling from the sky to the earth, one of which fell near him, he tried to lift it up, he could not, he tried to move it, he could not, so the people of Uruk gathered on the rock, they kissed her man, and he also took her in his arms, treated her as a friend, and considered her equal to him. His mother, the goddess of bulls, interpreted the dream to him, that he would have a friend who would stand with him in adversity a friend who would save him, a very strong friend. Enkidu and Shamat arrived in a small city before they reached Uruk, and the inhabitants of the city noticed Enkidu, and they admired his big form and physical strength, and he seemed to them like a rock that fell from the sky, and they knew that he would be the hero who would save them from Gilgamesh. They offered him bread and wine but he did not know what bread and wine were, so he was afraid of them, but he ate bread and drank wine after Shamamat reassured him. Then the townspeople brushed off his long hair and massaged it with fat. In return, Enkidu protected them from lions and wolves, and remained a guard over them while they slept. Enkidu noticed that a young man carrying food was heading to a destination. He went to him and asked him for whom that food was, and he told him that he was heading to a marriage ceremony. It is their custom to hold a party for married couples, and he offers them food, and then Gilgamesh comes to enter the wife before her husband. Enkidu was very angry about this, and decided to confront him and not allow him to do his shameful deed. Everyone went to the ceremony, entered the city of Uruk, and the people in the city saw him, gathered around him, noted his strength and immensity, 
and knew that he was the only one who could face Gilgamesh. Enkido went to the concert and stood in front of the door waiting for his arrival. Gilgamesh came to the concert, and he saw that Enkidu was blocking the door from him, so he got angry with him and asked him to move, he did not respond to him, and the two began to fight, and the walls shook from the intensity of the blows, and threw each other very hard, but Gilgamesh overcame Enkidu, and put his knee on his body, Gilgamesh calmed down, and Enkidu admitted to him his great strength. Then Enkidu cried for losing his strength. And Gilgamesh took him as a dear friend to him after that. Gilgamesh decided to go to the forest to fight Humbaba, the beast that guards the forest, and after fighting him he will cut down trees to come to his people dear and proud, and decided to take Enkidu with him to help. Funkadu knows the forest well but Enkidu was very afraid of Humbaba. He was breathing fire, his voice was like a huge flood, and he was able to hear the lightest sounds of grass in the forest. But Gilgamesh did not hide, and insisted on going despite Enkidu's fear, so Gilgamesh asked the blacksmiths to make weapons, and the two prepared to travel, and consulted people before they went and they advised Gilgamesh not only to rely on his strength, but on Enkidu's knowledge of the forest as well. However, they warned them not to go, and then Gilgamesh and Enkidu turned to the sun goddess Shamash, asking him to help fight them by pushing the air and whirlwinds in their favor from the south, north, east, and west. Gilgamesh's mother also asked Enkidu to protect him from dangers. Gilgamesh and Enkidu set off to the forest on a whim, the two traveled many days and long distances together, and Gilgamesh dreamed several times with disturbing dreams about his fight with Humbaba. The dreams scared him a lot, but Enkidu reassured him that his dreams signified only good and after each night of dreams, while traveling and interpreting Enkidu to her, Gilgamesh reassured. Gilgamesh and Enkidu arrived at the cedar forest where Humbaba was living, and when they reached it, fears began to run through Enkidu's heart, fear penetrated to his arms and legs, and Gilgamesh reassured him that they were together, and that they would fight side by side. The two headed to where Humbaba was, and approached him, and he appeared to them, and if he had that scary monster, he talked to them and warned them, and cursed them, so Gilgamesh trembled from the threat of Humbaba, and Enkidu controlled his fears, and called Gilgamesh to remove fear from his heart, so Gilgamesh settled down, and the two quickly headed towards Humbaba with a fierce attack. Their legs hit the ground, split, and the mountains cracked, and then the wind began to move to help Gilgamesh, moved by the sun god Shamash, and the two heroes struggled hard until we managed to catch Humbaba, so he came out in fear, and asked them for forgiveness, but Enkidu did not accept his request, and incited Gilgamesh to kill him, so they killed him, and cut off his head. Gilgamesh and Enkidu cut down some trees and carried them with them to return to the city gone men. So they made a raft out of logs and rowed it back. During their trip back to the city, Ishtar noticed the goddess of love Gilgamesh and admired him, so she asked him to marry her, but he refused, and he insulted her very much and among her mistreatment of her former husbands, she got very angry, and flew to heaven where her father Anu, the god of the gods, was present, and cried a lot, and told him that Gilgamesh insulted her. But her father reproached her for being the cause of the problem, she did not yield, and did not bother him for her. Father's Words And she asked him the bull of heaven, 
so that she would kill Gilgamesh with it, and if he did not comply with her request, she would destroy all mankind, resurrecting the dead to eat them all, and her father told her that if the bull was released, there would be seven lean years in Uruk, and there would be seven fat years before her. So did she prepare Ishtar told him that she had prepared enough crops. Her father agreed to give her the bull. Ishtar sent the bull down to the ground, and the bull drank a lot of water on the ground, and it dried up, and he drank the water of the Euphrates, and the water dropped a lot, and the bull breathed, and the ground split, and two hundred men fell into it. He breathed again and the earth split and Enkidu almost fell into it, but he jumped before he fell into its hollow and grabbed his horns, so Enkidu and Gilgamesh wrestled with the bull, killed him with the sword, tore his heart, and presented him to the sun god Shamash as a sacrifice, and Ishtar was angry for killing the bull, and called on them with the bull and woe. So Enkidu cut a piece of the bull and threw it on her face, and the people cheered for their victory. Enkidu woke up from sleep one day, he had a dream that bothered him a lot, where he saw the gods together after killing Humbaba and the bull, and they decided to take revenge for what Gilgamesh and Enkidu had done, and the result of the decision was that Enkidu would die and Gilgamesh would remain. Enkidu told Gilgamesh about the dream, Gilgamesh understood his interpretation and was very upset, he called the gods to him a lot so that he would not die, but his prayers were not answered. The symptoms of the disease began to appear in Enkidu, the disease gradually increased in severity day by day until the eleventh day, and he breathed his last breath and then died from the sight of Gilgamesh. So he grieved greatly for him, cried a lot, called him a lot, and asked the people of the city to sculpt a statue for him. After that, Gilgamesh began to think for himself, if death befell Enkidu, it must also befell him, that he would die some day. he did not accept his human side, he did not accept that he was fleeting, so he decided to look for the elixir of life and prepared to go to the immortal Atnabishtim, who was given eternal life after the great flood, to tell him about the secret of his survival. Gilgamesh left the city, set off for Atnabishtim, went to the forest, slept there to wake up and surrounded by lions, so he fought her, killed her, and then ate her. He walked in the forest for long days, until he reached the mountain of two peaks, where the passage was guarded by two large scary scorpions, their gaze was indicative of death, so the scorpions addressed Gilgamesh, and asked him why he came to this place, he told them that he was looking for Atnabishtim, they told him that no one could reach him before, no one could bypass the dark passage between the two mountains. The scorpions looked at Gilgamesh's dire state because of his long travel. They sympathized with him and allowed him to pass. Gilgamesh entered between the two mountains, and the sky became dark, and he walked in the darkness for hours and hours, and then ran for hours in the middle of total darkness. He could not see in front of him or behind until I fled and at the end of the corridor he found the light again, and at that point he found the garden of the gods, there he saw the sun god Shamash in his beautiful form, Shamash took pity on him for his shabby condition. He talked with him a little, and then Gilgamesh left the garden. Gilgamesh arrived at a house by the sea, and there was a woman making wine in that house, and she was afraid of him because of his bad form. Gilgamesh tried to enter her house, but she locked the door, and although he was able to break it, he talked to her instead of using his strength. He told her that Gilgamesh was the king of Uruk, but she did not believe him, because he did not look like kings. 
his skin melted from fatigue, so he told her about his search for eternal life, about Atnabishtim, and asked her to tell him about the destination that leads to him she showed him the way, but warned him not to cross the sea that leads to Atnabishtim, as one drop of it will kill him, and also told him about Orshnabi who has a boat, he can help him with rocks, which transports people across that deadly sea. Gilgamesh went to the forest, and completed the road to Orshnabi, and when he saw him, he thought that Gilgamesh would use weapons against him, so Orshnabi raised his axe to hit Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh grabbed Orshnabi's hand, and hit the rocks that were around him, and they shattered, Gilgamesh stopped after Orshnabi recognized himself, and he knew that Gilgamesh wanted to cross the sea. But the problem now is that Gilgamesh smashed the rocks that were transporting him through the Sea of Death. And there was only one way to move on. Orshnabi asked Gilgamesh to cut three hundred sticks from the trees of a certain length, and he did so, and he brought them all. So they boarded the ship, crossed the water until they reached the Sea of Death, and then Gilgamesh lowered one stick after another into the depth to push the ship forward, and each time he pushed using a stick he got rid of, so as not to touch the water in which his hand was drinking, and so on until they reached the bank. Finding an old man, Gilgamesh asked him about Atnapishtim the man who lived eternal life after the great flood, and that he wanted to know how he got eternal eternal life. After they talked about his friendship with Enkidu and the killing of Humbaba and the bull of heaven, then Enkidu's death and Gilgamesh's grief for him, his search for Atnabishtim and his long distances and many adventures, the man scolded him for abandoning all that he had of a good life in exchange for a strenuous adventure. Gilgamesh looked at the man, felt that he was at Nepishtim, he was the man he was looking for, he threatened him that he would wrestle with him for the secret, the secret of life. At Nepishtim began to tell his story on Gilgamesh. Atnabishtim lived in the city of Sheruba, near the Euphrates, the city was ancient, and the gods lived in it, but people became evil in it, so the gods got angry for their evil, and so she decided to flood the earth with a great rain to erase them all, so they hid the secret of the flood from them, and swore not to tell anyone about the plan. Oya, the goddess of wisdom, she did not tell any of the people, but she was smart, she talked with the fence of Atnabishtim's house, so that he could hear her indirectly, she asked the fence to warn him about the flood, to order him to make a big ship, to leave all his possessions, and Atnabishtim carried out her orders, and asked her, what can he tell people when they find out that he is preparing a ship? She responded by telling them that the gods were angry with him, and they were the ones who asked him to get out of the city. The people of the city, with the help of Atnapishtim, made a large ship, until it was completed, and then they lowered it into the river with great effort, collecting all the animals in it. After that, the gods began to send down storms, thunder, lightning and rain, the sky became dark, it rained, the earth overflowed, people tried to escape, but they all died, and even the gods were very scared of the horror of the scene, so they turned to heaven, grieved at what they had done, regretted what they had done, and cried over the death of humans. Storms and rains continued to fall for seven days, after which the wind subsided, the water calmed down with it and the sun appeared again. Atnabishtim searched for a land to land the ship on, but he did not find it, and after sailing he found a mountain, so he anchored the ship on it, and stayed on the mountain for seven days, so he sent a pigeon, if it returned, it means that the water still covers the land, 
and it did not find a land to settle on, and if it returns again, then he sent a swallow, which also returned, then he sent a crow, it flew away, and did not return again. He learned that the earth swallowed the water, so he made a sacrifice to the gods, and the gods admired the smell of the sacrifice, and came to him to participate in the feast. The gods were angry to discover that people survived the flood, everyone was supposed to die, and they knew that Aya was the reason for revealing the secret, but she preceded them and scolded the gods for their disgraceful act, so how can they erase all humans? Why did they not inflict punishment only on the deserving, and why did they not spare the undeserving? Why didn't they send lions or wolves to eat the comet? Why didn't they just starve the guilty to death? Perhaps her rebuke was in defense of her position to protect Atnabishtim from the flood, and then she asked them to decide what they would do with him and his wife, so the gods decided to give them a mortal life. To become like the gods, they decided to keep them away from the rest of mankind, and moved them away. After Atnapishtim told his story to Gilgamesh, he asked him which of the gods would defend him who will give him eternal life. Then Atnapishtim wanted to test Gilgamesh, to see if he could stay for six days and seven nights, as he had been in the ship all that time. But as soon as Gilgamesh sat down on the ground, drowsiness overcame him, he could not resist, and he fell asleep. Atnabishtim's wife asked him to wake him up from sleep to return to his country, but he refused, and he told her that if he did this, Gilgamesh would not believe that he had fallen asleep, so he decided to let him sleep until he woke up himself so as to prove to him that he had really fallen asleep. Atnapishtim asked his wife to make him bread for every day that Gilgamesh passed while he was sleeping, and to put bread next to his head. With each passing day the bread was rotting, and each level of rotting would indicate how long Gilgamesh slept. On the seventh day the first bread was very moldy, and the last one was fresh. Gilgamesh woke up from sleep, Atnabishtim asked him how long he had been sleeping, to which he replied that he closed his eyes for a simple moment until Atnabishtim woke him up. Gilgamesh could not believe that he had slept so long that Atnabishtim saw the bread over the previous days, each with its degree of rot according to the number of days. After that, Atnabishtim asked Orshnabi to return Gilgamesh from where he came, and asked Orshnabi not to return after revealing his place, so Atnabishtim took Gilgamesh and on the way told him about the secret of the plant of the gods, which is the plant that gives a person a mortal life. The problem was that this plant is deep in the sea, and it has many thorns. Whoever can catch it despite its thorns will have eternal life. Gilgamesh tied heavy stones to his legs and dived into the sea, looked for the plant, found it, grabbed it despite its thorns, took it out of the water, and then decided to return it to the city to be proud of it in public, and then to eat it in front of them to become young again, he will live forever but during the return he went to swim in the water, and he himself lamented the great effort he had made for life, and returned to his hometown empty-handed. This was the story of Gilgamesh, and although there is a rest in the twelfth tablet, it is not related to this story sequence, and the last story goes for a strange journey of Gilgamesh and Enkidu outside the scope of the story sequence I mentioned. I apologize for shortening the story and removing the dialogues in it, as well as the story contains repetitions and many oddities in the writing style, but what I mentioned is the whole story of Gilgamesh.